Please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5. Of course, you recognize that's the beginning of what we know as the Sermon on the Mount. You have the Beatitudes as the first part of that, going all the way down through verse 12. But I want to take you on over to verse 41. Verse 41. Of course, Jesus is giving instructions about things pertaining to the way we are to live in this world. And He gave those instructions as the whole New Testament was given within the confines of the customs and the environments of that day and age. And especially now, He is in Palestine and certainly in the middle of what Paul would call Jewry. And thus, he's applying those things to them because he's not suffered, bled, died, and been raised yet, and the church is not established. Yet some have called uh, the Sermon on the Mount the Constitution of the Lord's Church. If you study through it closely, you'll see that so much that's said in detail is applied to Christian living through most of the New Testament. The principles are established in the Sermon on the Mount. Now, let's not forget that they are a conquered people. They are under the Roman yoke, as was the whole of the known world. And that was what was giving them, as far as that part of the world was concerned, which was about all anybody knew anything about, what the Romans called the Pax Romana, which was the peace of Rome. And, of course, there are a lot of people who were under... Uh, responsibility to Rome and under their dominion. And Jesus now takes the way that they live, thinking how they travel and what they do, and think how we make plans and to do things, have certain times we want to do things, and so they did. And then He says to them something that's rather strange, maybe. And whosoever, now that nobody's left out when you got to whosoever, and whosoever compels you. So this goes beyond Roman bondage, doesn't it? This principle is going to apply everywhere. But it's applied here to the Romans in that time period regarding them being the conquerors of the Jews. Whosoever compels you. Now to be compelled to do something is usually made to do it against your will. You don't want to do it. You maybe will be grudgingly do it. And that's what he's talking about. So he says, whosoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too. Again, that's verse 41. I say again, remember the ruthless power of Rome. And it was not unusual then for Jews to be pressed into service for the purpose of assisting governmental people, especially soldiers and couriers, in their performance of their particular duties. Maybe we should think about how it would be when you've got your plans to do things. Maybe you planned on it a month, and you know you've got to remove yourself from how quickly we can travel and change things now. And if you're going to travel 20 miles in those days, that <laughs> took a little while to do that. But you've made plans to do it, and you start out, and here comes uh, some Roman soldiers, and they just say, come over here and help us move this furniture or this wagon or do whatever it is. How would you feel? Well, the Jews would especially. They'd feel worse than ever because of what we know how the Jews felt. We will notice later on, but they were conquered as they could be, but yet they would say, we've never been conquered by anybody. That's never understood that mindset, being where they were in their relationship to the Romans, but that's what they would say. I doubt we can imagine, I doubt we can begin to imagine how such tasks were especially obnoxious and distasteful to the Jews because the Romans were a hated people, were hated conquerors. And the Jews, knowing what they knew, how they believed, 
concerning their association with any Gentile, then of course these things would be even more distasteful to them. Think of how they dealt with even the publican, or someone like that. Because remember again, let me emphasize it, these are the same Jews who told Jesus they had never been in bondage to anybody. But they were. They can say what they want to, but they're in bondage. In our text, Jesus pictures one who is obliged to do as they were made to do, compelled to do, caused to do it when they had other plans to do other things. And it was to go the distance of a mile. That must have been the customary thing that the Romans would do. Would say, you go with me for a mile. And I suppose they'd pick somebody else to go however much further if they needed to with whatever it was they were doing. And, and you know, as somebody said, this must have been a terribly long mile to a Jew. Terribly long mile. But our Lord didn't just say, do only what you're compelled to do. Have you noticed that? He didn't say that at all. Is there a lesson for you and me today in that? Is this a part of Christian living? Is this a part of being faithful? Is this a part of what it is to wear the name Christian? Because He tells them then to do much more than a mile. Double it. After you're doing, after you've done what you were compelled to do, then go another mile. Now that seems rather strange. The Lord should have said, you've done enough. You weren't planning on doing this anyway. And uh, I know you don't want to do it. So just do a mile and then quit. But the second mile is the voluntary mile. It's the mile that goes beyond, must I do that? And someone has well said that Christianity is the religion of the second mile. So many people in the church measure their faithfulness to God and how much they mean to God in service to Him simply because they show up rather regularly at the services. Well, that's not to put down the importance of the assemblies. Certainly not. The assemblies of that we speak of wherein we worship God is very important. But in examining ourselves as we're taught to do to see whether we be in the faith, we must ask our question, question uh, is, is that, if you left that out of my life, my sibling with the saints, what else would there be about me that would show that I'm a Christian? One who is truly of Christ. So to these Jews at that time, such was indeed a difficult and obnoxious saying. I'm probably what happened is some of them said, I don't want to hear more from this fellow. Because they did that on some other matters. and People have done that all along. I remember one time years and years ago where I preached on the Masonic Lodge pointed out all sorts of things about it, how there's nothing about it that is authorized by the New Testament. And of course, you don't know what everybody's doing. And of course, some brethren make sure you don't know unless you are a CIA agent and FBI all rolled into one because they work it, making sure you don't know all they're doing. <laughs> well, this fella and his wife were all mixed up in that in a big way. If you don't know it, Eastern Star is the women's auxiliary or whatever it's called of the Masonic Lodge. And his wife was all mixed up in that and he was all mixed up in the other. When I pointed these things out, he decided that he would just have to leave. And you can see how dedicated he was to simple, plain, pure New Testament Christianity because he went straight from there to the Christian church. And what does that tell you about his understanding of doing only that which the New Testament authorizes? But you find out some people, the only reason they're in the church is they haven't been tried yet. Their faith hasn't been put to the test. And in America, everything, well listen, we have an easy Christianity in America. About the only thing 
that's going to stop you from being all God wants you to do in America is you. That's it. And I need to emphasize this at this point. The whole Sermon on the Mount is addressed to individual Christians and their personal conduct. Some people read some of the Beatitudes and, and they get to thinking, well, how can civil government do this and so when he says here, turning in the cheek and all that? He's not talking about what he teaches elsewhere on what God instituted civil government to do and the authority that it has. He's talking about how you get along with others and that you're faithful to God in doing it. And lo and behold, he says, you need to go ahead and dealing with others. These folks, these Romans certainly had no interest in the Jews' religion. And you need to show them an attitude of meekness and humility. Some people are always ready to bristle. You bump my freshly shined shoes and I'm ready to stomp your toes. Well, how dare you infringe upon my pretty shoes that I worked on for an hour to get them looked that way. Maybe we ought to realize this whole thing, and I talk about it being the whole Sermon on the Mount on personal conduct in uh, dealing with ourselves and others, that Paul must have had this in mind when he said in Romans 12, 1 and 2, that our bodies are presented as living sacrifices, sacrifices, sacrifices. What do you know about sacrificing anything for the Lord? And I put me in there too. What, what do we sacrifice? What have we given up in our lives that's so important to us that it hurt? That we deprived ourselves of things. It's very easy for me to stand here and say to you, here's what you ought to do. And if you don't do it, you won't be faithful. If you stay that way, you'll be lost. Very easy to do that. Pharisees had a good time doing that. Remember what Jesus said about them? Don't do as they do. When they sit in Moses' seat, in other words, when they're teaching you the actual law of Moses, then you follow it. But don't do as they do because they're hypocrites. That's basically what he said. They don't do what they teach. So here is individual conduct. Here is individual sacrifice. You're giving up what's important to you. I had plans to go see Mama this morning. I haven't seen her in two months. And she's sick. And now they're making me go do this. And you're telling me after going a mile and I don't want to go anyway that I now ought to go too voluntarily and regularly and willingly. And you know what Jesus would do if he was standing there looking at you and asking that question? Yes. That's what I expect of you. That's the religion of the second mile. So by such standards, it's not difficult to see how many of the Jews were, some one fellow said, a mile off in much of their thinking and practice, and I'm afraid such is so with a lot of us. So unfortunately, the passing of 2,000 long years has not diminished the distance to Christ pleasing service. True Christianity will always be the religion of the second mile. Whatever you're compared to do, compelled to do, then you go ahead and do more. The Lord doesn't get much mileage from this kind of attitude of I'll do only what I have to do. You ever notice sometimes we're buying a car, we don't know what kind of mileage does it get? How many times have you been around somebody that bought a car and a for very long, besides, if you don't mind telling me what you pay for it, it'll come up, well, what kind of gas mileage does it get? What if the Lord dealt with us that way? Well, he, he's been a member of the church 20 years. And an angel says, Lord, what kind of mileage are you getting out of him? <laughs> and the Lord hopefully would be able to say, well, he's one who goes the second mile. Just like I taught them to. This business has had an attitude of just a get-by attitude. This doesn't measure up to the standards of Christ. Look at uh, verses 21 through 23 of Matthew 7. Another very common scripture to Bible students. One that gets quoted a great deal among those who preach the gospel our Lord said, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Does that mean going second mile? 
If it doesn't, how do you leave it out? Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And I'll add something here. And when is I was compelled to do? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you, depart from me, you that work iniquity. If we don't go that second mile, if we don't have that disposition of heart, then we can see exactly how the Lord's going to deal with us. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. None are more deceived than those who seek fellowship with Christ in the areas of half-hearted, and I guess you'd say begrudged, service. If you look over to Revelation chapter 3, verses 14 through 16, we have presented us a letter the Lord wrote to church. So it's a tailor-made letter for that church, dealing with the reality of that church at the time you wrote the letter. It's the church at Laodicea. And he said, these things saith the Amen. That's a so be it. That's the way it is. That's the fact. It's the truth. The faithful and true witness. That's Christ. The beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. That thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou art cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot. I will spew thee. And the Greek word means vomit. Thee out of my mouth. Do you think that Matthew 5, 41 has any bearing on anything like this in among these members our Lord addresses at Laodicea? Do you think they were people that said, well, I've, I've done what I was required to do. Don't expect any more out of me. The Lord had a lot to say about that, didn't he? In just a few words, pretty powerful words. Our Lord asked, and this fits right in here. Matthew 5.47. Again in the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew 5.47. What do you more than others? Now I'm not asking that as the preacher here asking you. I'm asking you to ask yourself. What do I more than others? I have to ask myself that. Paul made the statement. Concerning his own preaching that he buffeted his body and brought it into subjection, lest after having preached to others, he himself was a castaway. If such a one as the Apostle Paul had to do that to be what God wanted him to do, and he would say to people like Timothy and every one of us, follow me as you see Christ living in me. Do you think that was sacrificial service that he mentioned? Can you read about the life of Christ and not see him going the second, third, fourth mile? what he gave up for the cause of Christ, what he underwent for the cause of Christ. So this is the real essence of second mile service. This is the real dividing line between true and lip service disciples. We need to recognize that. Through his word, Christ directs men in the way of second mile service to a righteousness that exceeds Matthew chapter 5 and verse 20. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So I think what we ought to be telling ourselves, preachers, elders, teachers, mother and daddies, husband, wives, whoever you are, that if you wear the name of Christ legitimately, is that there's never going to come a time when he says, well, I've done all I need to do. Why should I want to do any more? I mentioned this several times to you over the years, but I heard Brother Warren say this one time, and it stuck with me. We were visiting somewhere in a lectureship, and he was talking about service to God and various things like preachers do. And He paused for a little bit and said, I just hate to go before the Lord having done so little for him. So we need to start thinking about and whosoever compels you to go one mile, go with him too voluntarily. That's the religion of the second mile. That's Christianity. 
that sets the faithful apart from the near do wells and those who are big on talk and a little on action. If you're not a child of God this evening, you must believe with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God. You must repent of your sins, confess your faith in Him, and be baptized into Christ for the remission of sins. If you haven't done that, you're lost. Nobody's happy about that. Certainly God's not. But you're lost in your sins. And if you died now, there's no hope. And we urge you, therefore, to obey the gospel of Christ. Cheerfully and happily to get rid of all your sins. As a child of God, are you faithful? Do you believe? And is it put into practice in the religion of the second mile? If you need to repent of any sins, you need to do that. God's sake, Lord, pardon. Come confess again and pray to God for forgiveness. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation, we bid you come while we stand and sing.